let me welcome on to another episode of Top Dogs, a four-year starter, the all-time leader in assists at the University of Connecticut, the captain of our 2004 National Championship team, and the current director of player development for the UConn Huskies, none other than Talik Brown. What's going on, my man? How you doing? I appreciate you What's joining. What's going on, Rob? How you doing? Thank you for having me on. Was, it, was that a good enough intro? Oh, that was wonderful. That was great. <laughs> I think you hyped it up a little more. <laughs> so uh, you've been back uh, with the UConn program for a couple of years now. I believe if my math is right, this is year four for you. Yeah. Uh, and and I just kind of, can you talk to me a little bit around your decision uh, to come back to UConn and to come back to the program and to come back to the coaching staff? Uh, it was just like the whole 360 for me. You know what I mean? From playing here, as a, just being here as a player to being able to be on the coaching staff now. It's just an honor. I'm blessed to be here and because and when it's all said and done, I will always bleed blue regardless of anything. How, how much more different is it being on campus now that you are uh, you are a coach and someone that has to make some responsible decisions as opposed to being a college student having fun? <laughs> oh, it's totally different now. You know what I mean? I'm all grown up now. Uh, the atmosphere has changed. Uh, they have built a lot of new different things around on campus. So it's a whole different type of feel. But just being around the players, it just keep me all connected and engaged to back in the days when I was here. So someone that is better with words could probably phrase this a little more eloquently. But I do think that there is something poetic about uh, a guy like yourself that was kind of the quintessential, you know, UConn guy, the quintessential UConn mm -hmm. winner coming back and rejoining the program as they're, you know, pulling it out of the mud a little bit. The, the end of Kevin's tenure wasn't the best. And I don't think I'm really kind of speaking out of turn when I say that. Um, and I remember when when Danny first got the job, his first media day, uh, uh -huh. he told me that that he needed to create a culture of winning, right? Like he said that that was one of his priorities there. Yes. And I think you're like, that, is that one of the reasons why he reached out to you? Like, I, I don't think anyone understands that culture better than you do, right? Uh, that's kind of one of the reasons he brought me on board. You know what I mean? Uh, I won probably my entire life since I've been in high school, since I basically started playing the game, you know what I mean, when I was younger, so. I always had that winning mentality. So I know what it takes to win. And just I'm just a people's person, you know what I mean? I know how to communicate with the guys. I know how to work well with the guys. And I just got a lot of things in common with the guys just from being here for my day. So uh, let, let's talk about Coach Early a little bit. I'm going to leave this mm -hmm. one open-ended for you. Why is he the guy that can and will bring UConn back to the level that it was under uh, Jim Calhoun? Uh, I could say just his intensity. His uh, attention to detail, uh, he just brings it every single day, no matter what, rain, sleet, snow, he brings it every single day. He's the same person on, off the court, um, and he just, know what it, he just know what it means to win here at UConn, you know what I mean? It's a huge deal, it's a big deal just to continue to win and just have a successful program. Because he he understands, like he's, he's from Jersey City, he's not from Connecticut, he grew mm -hmm. up guy but he sent players to UConn he, he's been in and around the Big East he is a Big East guy so he yes. he understands what this team means to the state right yes yes he definitely understands what the team means to the state because he just been around he went to Seton Hall he played against UConn when he was a player so he he coached against UConn when he was at Rutgers so he just know what it means just to be here and the value of being at UConn so let me ask you this. Who is uh, better at cursing people out in practice, Danny Hurley Ooh. or Jim Calhoun? <laughs> uh, I'm going to say Coach Hurley is great at cursing people out in practice, and Coach Calhoun get the cursing people out during the game more. <laughs> <laughs> His quick hooks, man. He, uh, it, it was funny. We used to always joke about how, the, you know, it, you get that first whistle 23 seconds into the game, and he's already making the sub because he's mad at someone for missing <laughs> That's a rotation. Yes. Uh, coach, coach Hurley, uh, he brings that intensity to, to practice every single day. And then game time, he lets you just go out there and play. You know what I mean? Coach Calhoun, he was opposite. He would be relaxed a little more in practice, but game time, a uh, totally different person. Yeah, when the lights are brightest, that's when you got to start performing, right? Yes, you're right about that. <laughs> so I, I do think that there are some parallels between those two guys, right? Like one is from mm -hmm. Boston and one is from New York. So it's, it's, they're very different in that sense, but they're both kind of like hard scrabble, tough nosed guys that want teams to embrace that identity, right? That kind mm -hmm. of underdog mentality. Like we're, we'll win the fight. And if we win the fight, then we're probably going to end up winning the game too. So yes. um, do you, do you feel that with him around that program? 
uh, that was his main focus, basically, when he first got the job. You know what I mean? Just changing the culture, uh, getting the identity, um, uh, just being uh, basically resilient and just coming out, giving it your all every single day. Just a blue collar workers. You know what I mean? That's where we get it from. Just being blue collar workers, getting out there, carrying your lunch pail every day and just going to work. So it, that's one of the things that has me excited about this team because it feels like kind of one of those throwback UConn teams that mm-hmm. they're going to defend. They're going to force turnovers. You're going to pound the glass. You're going to beat people up. You're going to be more physical. You're going to work harder than anyone. And that's kind of what the best UConn teams were like. Of course they added like six or seven NBA players on those rosters. Mm-hmm. And I think that eventually you guys will be able to get there. But to me, it's like that, that core identity is, is what made this program great when you were there before uh now that you're back it feels like it's coming together again right am i am i am i on on the right track here no you're definitely on the right track i think you know that's one of the main things just having that uh, that identity you know what i mean having that culture uh so when the young guys come in they know they know who to learn from and know what they got to do so they just keep rolling you know what i mean so how do you do that how do you how do you get these guys to the point where they can kind of believe that and embrace that and play that way is it just about identifying the right players on the recruiting trail is it about uh having you know toughness and practice like how, how do you get guys to that level i think is is a little bit of everything you know what i mean just uh identifying the right guys on the recruiting trail uh making it just putting that extra effort in and practice and once you build the system in with the older guys and then uh, it would just carry you on right into the younger guys and it'll just be like a well or a brand or you machine. Mm-hmm. So I think the biggest difference between those two programs, I kind of alluded to this a little bit before, is that uh, when 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 Jim Calhoun was it like it, it was pros on pros on pros on pros. Your team had mm-hmm. Ben Gordon, Emeka Okafor, Charlie Villanueva, Hilton Armstrong, Josh Boone, Denim Brown, Rashad Anderson. I think all of those guys played in the NBA. Marcus Williams couldn't even get minutes the mm-hmm. year that the title. So, yeah. um, and, and that was after Karan Butler left a year earlier than he was. Uh-huh. So it, it's that talent level that was the difference maker. You are now the director of player development. And I think that the, the, the best way for this to grow is to identify, not like the guys that are going to be top 15 high school players in the class, is to go out and get the guys that are not quite at that level that can yeah. be top 15 picks, like a James Book Knight. So talk to me a little bit about how you guys work within the program to develop some of these players to turn them into James Book Knights. Uh, we basically um, just put a lot of time in uh, player development, and just trying to develop guys mentally and physically, uh, basically getting their bodies together, um, on the court, uh, film instruction, just basically going over with a whole total package to just try to get these guys to that next level and get to the guys where they need to get to. So is that, is it focusing on skill work? Is it focusing on getting their bodies right? Is it focusing on trying to improve, you know, the, their, their vertical jump, making sure that they get on the, uh, on the gun and get up a thousand shots a day. Like what is, mm-hmm. what, is it all, is it everything? It's, uh, it's basically all of the above. You know what I mean? We just call it like developing the man. You know what I mean? Cause we do all of that. On the, on the court, and as far as off the court, we try to develop them into human beings and regular people, you know what I mean? So after basketball is over, they'll be ready to succeed in life as well. So if James Booknight is kind of the blueprint on that, is this something that you're you're pitching to recruit, saying this is, this is what we can do? We can take you from being someone that wasn't recruited by the, the Dukes and the Kentuckys and wasn't necessarily considered someone that was a lock to be an early entrant. And now we can put you into that level. Like once you get those guys there, that's how you develop this program, right? Yeah. That's how you develop the program. Once you get the right guys, the right guys that can play for you, the right guys that are coachable, um, the right guys just to just want to buy into everything that you tell them and everything that you're talking about. You know what I mean? That's the type of guys you need on your team and have your team surrounded by. I thought what was interesting this summer for you guys is that there was no, you, you didn't bring in transfers. Like this was the summer of, of the transfer. Everyone's mm-hmm. going into that transfer portal. You guys didn't go and dip your toes into that transfer portal. What was the reason for that? Uh, coach just wanted to keep it simple, you know, just do it the old fashioned way, continue to try to develop our freshmen, continue to try, try to develop all the young guys and just continue to get better from there. You know what I mean? We didn't want to have, um, we didn't want to have no um, 
change in our roster. We just wanted to try to keep it the same and try to bring back the uh, same players and just try to develop these guys and get these guys to that next level so they could be successful. So one of the things that Coach Hurley has been talking a lot about this offseason is, is wall potential. Get guys on the wall, post people on the wall. I want to know, mm -hmm. are you on the wall? Do we have to leak Brown on the wall? You know, it's, it's all the lottery picks, all the guys that made it to the NBA on the wall. So, <laughs> so you know what I need to do? I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to take that intro that I just read, type it all out in a text. And I'm going to send it to, to Coach Hurley. I'm going to say, look, <laughs> why is Salik Brown not on the wall? We got to get him up there. <laughs> I got to get on the different. I got to get on the Husky of on the wall. That's the different Indeed. wall. But if I can get on that wall, I'll, I'll be I'll be excited. All right, well, we're, I'll, I'll get you up on that wall. I'll do what I can. To, <laughs> but he has mentioned that about uh, it was Jordan mm -hmm. Hawkins and and, uh, and Samson that he's kind of referenced, uh, said wall potential for those two guys. Yes. What What have you seen out of them so far? Let's start with Jordan Hawkins. He uh, he was playing with, I don't know if you can say it was the starters or whatever, but in the, in the scrimmage, he was playing with guys that you would kind of presume were the starters. So what have you seen mm -hmm. out of him um, so far during the season? What, what are you expecting out of, out of him this season? Uh, he just could, he could shoot it at a high level. You know, he gets the shot off quick, comes off of pin downs, one, two dribble pull-ups. Uh, got a great feel for the game. Uh, we got to continue to just get him tougher and um, just get him playing defense at a high level, you know, nonstop for Jordan. But it, sky's the limit for him. Yeah, so what is what is it? Can you just kind of like what I don't want to like put a comparison next to his name, but can you just kind of like break down who he can end up being um, down the road? Like, is he a guy that could be a 15 point per game guy for you? Is he a guy that you could see playing in the league one day? Like how what can he end up being? Uh, he could definitely end up playing in the league one day. You know what I mean? He'll start here first. So uh, he got to make a, a great impact while he's here, but he could definitely be in the NBA one day. So uh, uh, for Samson. I saw that Danny the other day referred to him as a pterodactyl. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about him, and can we make that be a nickname that sticks for him? <laughs> We're gonna have to make that a nickname for him. But Samson, great athlete, gets up, gets up and down the floor. Great rim runner, block shots, shoot threes. He does a little bit of everything. You know, he's very talented. He's still just trying to figure everything out. But once he figure everything out, oh, it's gonna be over. Sky's the limit for that kid as well. Is he skilled too? Like, can he make a shot? Can he put the ball on the floor a little bit? Yeah, he could make. He could definitely make a great shoot the three, put it on the floor a little bit. Got a light, nice little touch. His main thing is just figuring everything out right now. You know what I mean? He's figuring out the plays, figuring out where he got to be on the floor, just trying to make the right decisions right now. So how do you how do you help guys with that? Like how do you how do you teach them? It's one thing to be able to say like, look, we need you to be a better shooter, so you're going to shoot mm -hmm. a thousand shots a day. Five hundred going to your left, five hundred going to your whatever it ends up being. How do you help guys kind of pick up what the offense is supposed to be? How do you help them learn what what read they're supposed to make in this specific situation when they're supposed to roll to the rim or pop for a three kind of a thing? Oh, uh, that's just a lot of film breakdown. You know what I mean? Showing guys where they need to be at. Uh, uh, the opportunities for them during the plays where they could be able to score, where they could be able to shoot, just trying to make the right reads. Uh, that's just a lot of film breakdown and a lot of reps as well. All right. So Adama Sinogo, mm -hmm. it feels like everyone I talk to around the program is, is saying similar things to what they were saying about James at this point last season. Right. Uh, I know he wasn't the, the, the all big East guy. I think that there were, uh, some wrinkled feathers within the program about that. I think that he probably should have gotten a little bit more respect from those yes. pre all Big East teams. Same thing with James last year. So um, what have you seen out of him so far in practice? And am I right to be fired up that this kid could end up being a guy that is, is uh, you know, one of the best big men in college basketball? Uh, you're right about that because his work ethic is just unbelievable. You know, every single, he's just obsessed with the game. Uh, he's obsessed with getting better. He puts everything into it every day, every morning. He's in the gym working out before he goes to class, gets back in here, practice right after practice. He's getting extra shots up. He's just like obsessed with it. You know what I mean? Just being great. He just wants to be great. And those are the guys that you need. It's not it's not mm -hmm. the players that just have that length and athleticism. You, you need guys that love playing basketball. That that's That's the difference right there. It's not just someone that uh, has the measurables you need dudes that love to play yes. and I think correct me if I'm wrong but 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 book was one of those guys too right 
Yes, Book was definitely one of them guys. He just loved playing it, loved being around the game, just had so much passion and enthusiasm for the game. And that's that that's the only way you're gonna be successful, you know what I mean? It's just having that love and that passion for it and just giving it all you got. And then it'll come all back around because the game, whatever you give the game, the game's gonna give you back. Right. And he was he's a New York guy too, right? Yes, yeah, so he's a Brooklyn guy. Yeah. Are you <laughs> having a Brooklyn guy? I'm from, I'm from Queens. Yeah, I was gonna he's say a Brooklyn guy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. As long as he's wearing the uh, the husky colors, it's good to go. Yeah, right? that's all that matters. <laughs> we brothers at the end of the day. <laughs> there you go. Before we move on, let me tell you guys a little bit about our partners over at Bet River Sportsbook. If you haven't signed up for Bet Rivers yet, now is the time because they are offering a $250 match bonus for your first deposit. But what sets them apart is that they require just one playthrough to turn your bonus into cash money. With their rush pay instant approval, withdrawing your winnings is safer, it's more secure, and it's more reliable. Now that basketball season is tipping off, get in on the action at betrivers.com today or by downloading the BetRivers iOS app. You must be 21 years or older. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. And while I got you here, Let's talk about the Field of 68 Media Network, where college basketball matters most all year round. This is a digital media and podcast network that we've been building over the course of the last year. We have shows hosted by some of your favorite players covering the program that they love the most. AJ Guyton hosts the House of Hoosier. Eric Devendorf covers Syracuse on the scorer's table. Dan Dickow hosts the Gonzaga Bulldog broadcast. We have Florida's Patrick Young and Duke's Andre Dawkins, and North Carolina's Shimon Williams, and Michigan's Stu Douglas, and Illinois' Deion Thomas. The list goes on and on and on. We have more than 30 shows right now. So hit the links below and check them all out. And while you're at it, make sure that you go check out the Field of 12 Media Network, your home for college football. Um, all right, so I, I do want to circle back and, and talk a little bit about some of the teams that you played on because, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. I, I mean, look, I mentioned everyone that you had. There were, I think, there were seven NBA players on that team that uh, that that won the national title. Yeah. What were those practices like? I mean, your 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 second team had Hilton Armstrong and Josh Boone, who were both, I believe, they were both first round picks, right? Yeah. That, that, uh-huh. was, that was the second team. That's who yeah. Emeka was going up against every single day in practice. So, so talk to me about it. Like, what were those practices like? Uh, practice was like just competing against high level teams. You know what I mean? It just got us so ready for the tournament and Big East tournament. We were playing high-level top teams. It just got us ready for that because every day it felt like a game. You know what I mean? It felt so intense. You had to bring it every day. You had to try to win your battle, win your matchup every single day. So you had no days off, you know what I mean? In practice, no days off. And then once the game came, you had no days off. But once the game came, it made it kind of easier because you just been going at these guys every day in practice. That's part of why, at least my theory is that's part of why Mecca made the the jump that he did um, mm-hmm. during his college career. Because you don't you don't just get better like that without having that kind of competition every single day in practice. Yeah, no, not at all, man. Uh, iron sharpens iron, so that just got him better and got him going every day. You know what I mean? And then uh, Mech going at Josh got him better. Josh going at Hilton got him better, and it was just a trickle trickle down effect. You know what I mean? Everybody got better. Everybody got something out of it. All right, so let's talk about some of the specific successes that you had. You know I need to ask you about the Duke comeback because that is uh, one of, I think, my favorite moments as just a yeah. sports fan in general. Uh, you guys were down. I think you were down the entire second half. You were down by mm-hmm. as many as 11 points, and it never really felt like Duke wasn't in control of that game. Um, so what are, you, what are you thinking in that second half? Is there a point where you're like, man, I think we might have fucked this up. I don't know if we're going to be able to, to turn this thing around. It, it was points during the game where I think that was going through a lot of uh, a lot of the guys' minds, but uh, we knew we had Coach Calhoun. We, you know what I mean. We knew we uh, Mech was going to get back in the game because I think he went out first half because he was in foul trouble. So mm-hmm. we had to wait for him to just uh, pass that little stint and get back in the second half. But it was going through the guys' brain, but we just kept going forward and kept pushing. You know, we had been through a lot that season. So we just wasn't going to die down and let it just go from there. Yeah, that was the uh, that was the big talking point coming out of that because there was a, both teams had their front lines getting foul trouble in the first mm-hmm. half. Yeah. Calhoun, Calhoun sat sat his guys. Duke played their guys, and they ended up. I think 
uh, in the final five minutes, they were playing. I don't even remember the guy's name. That's 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 who he was. But uh, yeah. it was. I think that ended up being the difference, right? Yeah, that was basically the main difference. Because once Met got in the game, he just turned the game around, and then we kind of like took control of the lead and came back and started fighting. Yeah, it was it was the final three minutes, and I have it written down here. You want uh-huh. to? Yeah, <laughs> started with that Rashad uh, Rashad Anderson three in the corner. Three. Uh-huh. Then you found him, right? Then yeah. the next two plays down, it was you throw the ball into a mecca, and he uh, he has a turnaround um, to cut it to one. Then he has the put back to put him put, put him back. In, you guys in the lead. So talk me like talk me through some of those possessions and kind of what's going through your head when when you're in. I mean, it's the final four, man. It's the final four, and you're making these yeah. plays as a senior. Like what's what's going through your head in that moment? Uh, mainly, what's going through my head is winning the game, <laughs> but <laughs> but. Uh, for our strategy, you know, I mean, we had to get it to Mech. We had to get the ball down to him. He's the best player in the country, best big man in the country. He'd been out the game. And we kind of knew when, once he came back in, he was going to bring that uh, resilience effort out there and bring us home, you know what I mean? So that was kind of the main plan, try to just get it down to Mech and continue running through him. So just take me through that last play where you ended up, where you took the lead. Because you throw it into him, and if I remember correctly, he misses a t- turnaround right mm-hmm. and then josh boone that got the put back put, put back yes josh boone got the put back so you're i mean you're watching that from about 40 feet away just yeah. what do you remember <laughs> about that play what do you remember about seeing that and, like it's out of your hands then like you set it up you get the ball into the post and it's kind of like all right you big fellas you got to go figure it out right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i was but at that point i was still, i was kind of confident because we had that momentum we had we was, we was on a little run we had that momentum guys was feeling good about themselves at that point in the game so, like, I kind of knew we was going to win during that time. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I want to know what, what the locker room was like at halftime because I, I'm sure that, mm-hmm. that, that, that Coach Calhoun was, uh, was melting paint off the walls there. So, I want to know what the <laughs> locker room was like at halftime, and I want to know what it was like at the end of the game once you finally won and made it to the, to the uh, national title game. I'm going to say it, it wasn't that bad at halftime like it usually be because it was an intense game. It was a big time game. So coach just kind of left it on us to figure everything out. You know what I mean? It was a team, it was a team, uh, a player led team. So coach just kind of let us, left us there to figure it out and talk it all out. He came in with his little motivational speech, but it was just kind of like up to us because this was just life and death. You know what I mean? It was over after this. So we had to make it happen. And then what what are the what was that celebration like after you uh you finally it's always interesting to me, right? Because you had this unbelievable comeback and this unbelievable moment, but in two days you got to turn around and you have to actually yeah, no. play the game that matters even more. So what <laughs> like what is that what's that moment like in the locker room and after the game? Did you have do you get give yourself like an hour? It's like, all right, I'm gonna enjoy this for the rest of the night, and then we got to turn around and get focused. Like, what was what's that? Yeah, I think on? I think we enjoyed it for like an hour, 45 minutes, and then we was refocused on Georgia, on Georgia Tech at that point. But that felt like everybody was talking like in the locker room. That felt like the championship game. You know what I mean? So we was just kind of at that point. I think everybody was just their confidence level was like on 100 at that point. So we were just we just kind of knew we was on a roll. We knew we was in the right direction and we knew we had a chance to win the championship. Yeah. And and of course you did. So um, mm-hmm. the, the final, like it wasn't, it was I, like it wasn't even a fun game to watch, man. Like I think you guys were up by like twenty five in the first half. Uh, so. uh-huh. so yeah. At what point did you realize? All right, okay, we did this. We're cutting down these nets. I'm getting this ring. We're getting this title. That banner is going up in Gamble. We, we did this. Um, probably about uh, five minutes into the second half. I kind of knew it was kind of over, you know what I mean? Because they would have had to work too hard to come back. And we was going to keep scoring regardless. So probably like five minutes into the second half, I knew it was kind of over. So uh, what, is it, what does it mean to you to be a part of that? Because I, I thought – so I was, I was at the 2011 title game. I was at the 2014 title game. I had the press credentials. I was on the floor in the locker room and everything. Mm-hmm. And the thing that stood out to me more than anything else was how many mm-hmm. alumni – were involved there like Khalid was there Rip was there Ray was yeah. there it felt like every single UConn player that I'd ever watched growing up was was either sitting behind a bench uh had a ticket somewhere was on the floor after the game so what what does it mean to be a part of that and to be someone that was so instrumental in, in bringing home one of those titles uh it just means a lot you know what I mean because it's just like a brotherhood here 
It's just like you do you you're not doing it just for yourself. You know what I mean? You're doing it for the university. You're doing it for the players that have been here that just sacrifice everything and that put forth all the pain and everything they had into the game just to just to be a part of what's going on right now. You know what I mean? Just the success that's happening. So it just meant a lot, you know what I mean? For just the, our whole entire team, guys around, just the campus, just everything. It meant a lot to everybody. Right. Right. All right. So next one I need to ask you about. Do you know what it's going to be? Can you guess? Uh, Madison Square Garden. The shot against Pitt 2002. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I, look, did you know you hit it? Did you know it was good? Or did you just let it fly? And it's one of those where you put it up, it's like, please go in, please go in, please go in. That I kind of, I kind of, when it left my hand, I kind of knew it was good because it was on the right track. But I thought maybe I was like, it's going to either be an air ball or go right in. Like that was going on in my mind. It's going to be an air ball. It's going to just hit the bottom of the net. And I got lucky it hit the bottom of the net. And I went off from there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's one of the, that's one of the iconic moments, I, I mm -hmm. think. Big East tournament history because that that ball was in the air for like legit. I know, I know. Was hit the Raptors <laughs> on that one. <laughs> I know, I know. I didn't know when the ball was going to land. It felt like it was in the air for like 10, 15 seconds. Yeah, it was. So, what was <laughs> what was the was that the play that you guys wanted to run? Because I think what happened was Ben got it on the wing, right, and it gets knocked out of his hand. And it goes out of bounds. You guys have two seconds on the shot clock. Double overtime. It's pit. It's the Ben Howland pit teams that are really, really good. So what is like what's what's that moment? What's that play call? What what are you what are you drawing up there? I think coach drew up something for Ben. That was the main thing, but they took it away. They denied him the ball. So he he wasn't able to get it. And that's when I popped to half court and I was able to receive the ball. I threw a little pump fake, took one dribble, then casted it up from almost half court. So and they call I guess that that shot kind of changed my life after that. Yeah, I mean they called it Steph Curry range. Should it be to yeah. Brown? <laughs> <laughs> but it was just it was a special special moment moment for me, an unreal moment for me because I'm a New York guy. I'm from New York. I dreamed about playing at Madison Square Garden. The next day, I was on the back of the Daily News downtown Brown. So it was just a dream come true. I like I just child. That's what you dream of growing up in, in New York City. So, I mean, that's a perfect segue because I got to ask you, there was another New York City kid playing mm -hmm. for UConn in the garden, making uh, a move against Pitt, went down as an iconic shot. People forgot about Sleek Brownshaw. All we talk about now is Kemba Walker breaking. Yeah, Kemba. no. Are you, are you mad at Kemba? Have you had that conversation? Like, why'd you have to do that to me? <laughs> no, it's, it's all for the program, so I, I'm excited for him. <laughs> hey, you know that's a that's a very uh, that's a good political answer right there. That's, that's a good way to keep him. Like <laughs> so, what is I I do want to know? Like, do you mm -hmm. are, are are the players and the people within that program aware of the pride that the the UConn fan base takes in taking over the Garden every year and, and for. Uh, for the Big East tournament, like that, that's a thing, you know, that's the fans say that that's our building. We got three home courts, right? We got Gamble, yeah. we got the XL center and we got Madison square garden. Like, are you guys, are you guys aware of that? Uh, I know, I know I'm aware of it. I know the coaching <laughs> staff is aware of it. Uh, we try to uh, tell the players about it and just keep telling, talking to them about the history of UConn and what went, went down and who was here and what happened during the times and just try to uh, reiterate stories to these guys. But, uh, the guys haven't really been able to experience it because of COVID last year. So this would be a big year for us right now. And they'll be able to experience what we talked about through the last couple of years. Well, I mean, that's, that's the thing about this season, right? It's, last year you were back in the big East this year. Mm -hmm. You're really back in the big East. Cause you got to yes. go play in front of the 9,000 people at Seton hall, right? You got to go play in front of uh, uh, fans at uh, Villanova. You got to go play in front of fans at Providence, which is always a crazy place to go play. I don't think people realize how insane that uh, mm -hmm. that, that that fan base is. So, yeah. um, are are you? I mean, you got to be looking forward to that, right? Oh, I'm just I'm I'm thrilled. I can't wait for that. You know what I mean? Because last year we was we came back to the Big East, but like I was saying, it was COVID, so it wasn't fans and it was different rules. And so this year things are just kind of back to normal. So. I'm excited just to be in a mix of everything, you know? <laughs> You're excited to get cussed out by all those Friar fans sitting behind the bench, huh? Yeah. <laughs> which, 
which, that uh, too. <laughs> when you were playing, which was the which which fan base was the craziest? Like who had the who had the rowdiest student section? The place where you like, wow, I can't believe it. they just they just cussed out my mom. Like what, who who had a place like that? I could say Rutgers. Rutgers was probably the rack was probably the hardest place to play. <laughs> The rack was hard to play. We never really won there every time we went there. The rack was kind of hard to play there. Yeah, it's because what happened was all the people that were uh, the 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 casting call for the Jersey Shore would go straight from MTV <laughs> to, right. you know, to watch the game to go crazy. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right, so I, I, got, I need another story from you. I need your best Jim Calhoun story, practice, game, whatever. I need a great I know you, I know you got some. And I know you probably got some that you can't tell on a podcast, but uh, we can we can rate this one PG-13. All right, so give me give me a great Jim Calhoun story. Probably one of my greatest Jim Calhoun stories uh, would probably be uh, we was I guess all the players, you know what I mean. We were just going through our little phase at the time, and uh, coach was talking about toughness, and everybody was laughing at coach, and then coach told us, uh, <laughs> "You guys think you tough? You 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 MFs think you tough, right?" He was like, um. Let's go in this. Let's go in the room over here. Lock the door and see who's the first person to come out. <laughs> <laughs> so that was his main thing. So we just was on the all year talking about, yeah, let's go in the room, coach, and see who comes out first. <laughs> <laughs> how long? How long were you on the team before you could actually understand everything that he was saying? Uh, yeah, maybe it took me probably like my junior year. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a translator? It was like Tom Moore over there on staff, and he was, and, and Jim would just come out and cuss it. He'd be like, "Hey, what he said was this: you need to run this screen and come over here off this." <laughs> yeah, you got to run circle, chase over here, come back, ball screen right here. <laughs> Everything is gonna be all right. Don't worry about it. <laughs> he was the first guy on uh, on ESPN where you needed subtitles when he he was calling basketball games for the <laughs> broadcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so I got I got two more questions for you. One, mm-hmm. is, one I think is going to be the easier one. Uh, we talked a little bit about Adama. We talked a little bit about um, about some of the freshmen coming in. I, I don't think we actually talked about RJ Cole. I'm a huge RJ Cole guy. I think he's going to have a big year. So who who on this team do you think is going to be taking that next? Like we need we need someone to step up and kind of take over that star role that 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 that, yeah, uh, no. that book is leaving. So who are you counting on to kind of be that star role, and who are you expecting to maybe play? a little bit of a bigger role than, than people are expecting out of them? Uh, for the star role, I expect it to be Adama Sanogo and R.J. Cole to play a major part in that. And um, for just a piece nobody's really talking about that I think need to have a great season would probably be uh, Tyrese Martin. Yeah, he's really got to step up for us and add, and add a little bit more depth and, and add a bit, little bit more than he did last year. Yeah, I mean, he, he, I don't think people realize how good he is when he gets going because he can yeah, pass, yeah. he's athletic. Mm-hmm. You can put him on twos, you can put him on fours. He's going to rebound the ball for you. Yes, yes. He could post up, get out in transition. You know what I mean? We just got to get him going and playing at a high level every single day. So is is it true that you and, and RJ were actually in the same recruiting class? Because there's no way that 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 I, I say kid like he he looks like he's about a thirty year old man with that beard. He was big, senior, right? <laughs> he does look old, but <laughs> all right. Here's... I guess he I guess he got some wisdom for us, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to end it with this. This is a tough one. I'm going to put you on the spot with this one. You're okay. a New York City guy. And yeah. New York City is a place that a lot of people consider the pizza, uh, the pizza capital of the world. You now mm-hmm. live and work in Connecticut, a state where the real ones know is the actual pizza capital of the world. So I'm putting you on the spot. Who has better pizza, New York City or New Haven? New York City. We got the flat <laughs> crust, the thick crust, flat bread, a little bit of cheese, marinara sauce. I'm gonna go with the New York City pizza. So, so here, here's what I'm gonna do. Next time I'm in Connecticut, <laughs> I'm gonna hit you up. I'm gonna take you with me. We're gonna go to Sally's in New Haven. I don't uh-huh. know what real a real old school pizza place is like, and you're gonna change your mind. That's my goal okay. now. Okay, all right. Uh, Brown uh, saying New Haven has the best pizza in America. Okay, we we definitely gotta do that challenge. Then we gotta go to New York and try Vinny's pizza around mm-hmm. my neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, you're on. We'll do it. Okay. We'll, do it. well, listen, Talik. 
thank you for being on, man. This was awesome. Uh, and, you know, I got to give you one of these before we leave. You could Huskies. How'd I, how'd I do there? Was that not bad? Pretty all right? Great job. You crushed it. Great job. <laughs> Perfect, man. I appreciate the time. All right. Thank you. I appreciate you having me here. Thank you. <laughs>